when we had children coming forward or, that were being reported as having harmful sexualized behaviors and hurting other children, it was mostly because of pornography and their exposure to pornography. And that was in a 10 year period. So I saw that so clearly in that time, you know, in the last few years, the stat in Australia is that the average age of a child seeing pornography for the first time is now eight years old. Now, an eight-year-old cannot understand what they're seeing and understand what's going on in that. And there's a real big correlation between the time they start seeing pornography or, you know, being exposed to pornography and, you know, when they start enacting or reenacting. Well, I'm so excited to talk with you. You are a child safety strategist. So can you talk about your background a bit and what roles and experiences have led you to become a child safety strategist? So when my daughter was nine months old, I saw an ad in the paper, the local paper, for to become a police officer. And I had worked in administration before that, so I was really good at paperwork. And uh, I was didn't want to return to that work after my daughter went, you know, was ready to go to daycare or. So I, um, I thought, yeah, I could do this. Told my husband, hey, I think I want to be a police officer, and he said, okay. And off we, off, off I went. And when she was two, I got into the West Australian Police over here in Australia, and, um, and yeah, and the next thing I knew, I was dealing straight straight away. I was dealing with child sexual abuse um, cases yeah. and became a specialist child interviewer. So uh, when she was three and in Australia, not necessarily in every jurisdiction in Australia because each state has their own policing. Um, but uh, when I became a specialist child interviewer, I used to sit across the table from children and get their evidence from, from when they um, when there was a report of child sexual abuse or, or physical abuse. And yeah. um, my daughter was only three years old at the time and I didn't realise how prevalent it was in our community and it, it really uh blew my blinkers off basically and from that moment forward I was lit a fire under me and I was I wanted to focus on child sexual abuse and and protecting kids uh so yeah so pretty much most of my career was devoted around that I mean I did some general duty policing and um I then became a detective after four years in the police and and wanted to be the person that locked up child sex offenders and uh spent time in the child sexual abuse squad in Western Australia and interviewing children uh investigating child sexual abuse cases and then uh also managing child sex offenders when they were released from prison so that was my experience in the police I was in the police for 10 years and then on leaving the police I uh, sort of felt a little bit lost. Um, I actually left the police because I had PTSD and my daughter and family, my husband sort of said, you know, we want you to be mentally well. We don't want you to keep going like this. So they encouraged me to leave. Um, and then from there, I actually fell into a job uh, teaching or, or going to schools and educating around online safety and cyber safety. So that's what I've done for the last three years. That's such a unique journey. And I'm sure, you know, you have such unique perspective on these issues because of that work. You know, how did that time and your time on the police force influence how you have raised your daughter with technology and in this world? It changed everything. And online, unfortunately, I think parents of my generation or like my daughter was born in 2008, we had no idea what we were signing up for when we when we got social media and when we started using social media, we had no idea what they were going to do with our information and data. So we were sharing everything about our children back then when we first became, you know, users of Facebook. We didn't really think about implications that that was going to have. And I really wish I had the foresight to know what I know now that, uh, you know, our children aren't ours to share online. That's so well said and also just an experience so many parents have today that we hear from so many parents, but but so many of them don't have quite the insights that you have as well. How do you advise people on, you know, when to start having conversations with their children about these things? I You mentioned you spoke with your daughter at three years old. What do those conversations look like? How do you approach this topic with parents who are saying, you know, help us? <laughs> Well, most parents don't realise how, how young we need to be having these body safety conversations because, um, but as soon as your child's able to, you know, be able to talk and talk back to you, you can be having those, you know, body safety conversations. And, and like I said, three years old is about 
the time when, you know, they're able to retain some of that information. But, you know, you can start talking about consent from the moment you have your child, you know, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to change a nappy now. I'm going to do this, you know, explaining what you're doing or your to your child. And then um, but part of those conversations in body safety include, you know, you have the right to feel safe at all times. And, you know, even when I'm upset with you, you have the right to feel safe. And, and we take that for granted. And even until I learned that, you know, I was in my 30s or just early or just about 30, and I never had anyone tell me I had the right to feel safe. So the fact that we're having these conversations with young children means that we're changing what it looks like for them and their safety. And, um, you know, you have the right to feel safe at all times. And also, also, you know, you can talk to someone about anything, you know, being able to have those open communication and those open conversations and realizing that it's not our, jo- our child's job to protect themselves from abuse, but it's our job. But we can arm them with tools to know what it is that they need to watch out for. So, for instance, you know, I was teaching my daughter, you know, what's private parts and, and, and you know, what's inappropriate. Um, and, you know, people worry, parents worry that we're, you know, exposing children to the wrong things or we're, t- we're um, you know, making it so that it might happen, inviting things into their lives. But actually, no, we're not. We're actually arming them with the tools that they need because, you know, one in three girls, one in five boys, and um, and it's most likely some, someone who's known to them. So someone in your own family group, someone in their schoolyard, someone in their kindergarten. Uh, the other things that you teach about, are, you know, what it feels like to feel unsafe. A lot of parents and a lot of people don't actually understand when they feel unsafe, what it feels like you know, butterflies in your tummy and sweaty palms and, you know, you you feel like you can't talk or you feel a bit anxious. You know, I was feeling a bit nervous before we got on today and I had some of those warning signs, but I knew that what I was stepping into and what I was about to do and that was, you know, risking on purpose or it's fun to be scared kind of things. But children need to know that the difference between safe and unsafe and if we don't understand it, what it feels like in our body, then how do we know to go talk to someone about it? So they're all the, the lessons or and so many more lessons, but those are the main lessons that we teach about surprise versus secret, you know, private pictures versus public pictures, Those, all those things that, and we can be having those conversations from a very young age, from three onwards, I'd say. Are there other questions that you get asked from parents quite a bit of, of them wondering how to address specific topics in, in these areas? It's, it's interesting to me because I know because I've sat across the table from hundreds of children and there's a little bit of anxious anxiety and nervousness and a little bit of fear because as adults, we tend to overreact. We tend to stress. We tend to make um, children think that, that, well, we don't do it on purpose all the time, but we make them think it's their, pro- their fault, their problem, where we right. really need to approach things with a open heart, open conversation and say, hey, you know, nothing you could ever do will ever make me stop loving you. That's one of the things I have said to my daughter and I really press because we need to make sure our children know because lots of times our little people and our young people are trying to protect us as parents. They're trying to parent us. So we need them to know that, um, you know, we're the parents in this situation and that nothing they ever do will ever make us stop loving them and that we're here for them to make them feel safe. We're here for them to tell us what's going on and that some things are for only adults to deal with, not for kids, because kids try and take on so much because they just, they just do. They just want to protect everyone around them. Yeah. And I think that's such a good reminder that like most of the time as adults, we are more afraid or embarrassed or uncomfortable or something to approach the topic than, than the kids we're speaking to. And we found, you know, at Fight the New Drug, we present in schools to um, middle schoolers and high schoolers or junior high and high school aged youth. And we found a lot of the time they know a lot more than any of the adult, adults in the room want to believe that they know, right? And so it's like if we meet them where they are and we say, hey, we know that you're aware of this and we want to help give you the tools to address this appropriately and, and properly, that's what they're wanting, right? So if if adults are are approaching this, parents are approaching this, it's often invited by young people. And really, like, if you, you know, when you go into a school and you start talking about these topics, kids, and especially I love 
kids under the age of 12, they're really like in, you know, they're so engaged and they're like really excited because you're talking topics that are important to them and really they are and they want to talk about because they don't quite understand it yet or it's confusing. They want to know because they want to be able to, they want to alleviate some of their fears and anxiety around it. But I always tell parents, you know, don't make it about your child or, you know, they're, they've got the issue or that they need. It's like what could kids do if, you know, you hear something in the news. Hey, I heard on the news that children are being approached online by strangers. What do you think kids could do if they ever get approached by someone online? Or have any of your friends ever had this happen? Or, you know, what do you think kids could do if this happens? You know, by ma- not making it about them specifically, then, yeah. Right. It makes it more... Uh, approachable makes the topic more approachable for everyone it just makes it so that kids you're dealing with things that are actually real in their lives but you're making it so that they can have a conversation with you and it doesn't feel like it's about them and it's really important that kids don't feel like they're the ones that we're focusing on and they're more likely to talk about their friends than they are to talk about themselves uh, so, you know, and then you can go down the line and say, hey, what do you think you could do if you're in that situation? Going off of the fact that the internet is so prevalent in the lives of young people today, and you mentioned social media a moment ago, can you talk a little bit about some of the things that parents should especially be aware of in terms of ways that kids can be approached by predators online or where young young kids and young adults need to be aware of how they can be safe online in this digital age? So one thing that I've realized over the last few years, which I didn't realize when I was a police officer, was that there's two types of online groomers. There's uh, romantic online groomers that are there because they are interested and attracted to children. And then there's the financial online groomers who are interested in just extorting children. So The thing is, is that we don't just have one type of people looking for children because they're attracted to children. We have people out there that are really just bad, mean people who want to get, uh, you know, want to extort your children. And so it's coming from two angles or multiple angles, really. Um, So what I would like parents to realise is that, um, first of all, that we need to have our finger on the pulse on what our kids are doing online and to understand who, they, who they're talking to, what apps they're using, have them show you what they're doing online so that they can actually, so you've got an idea of what's going on. You know, um, I've got a 15-year-old and even up until recently, I still check her phone now and again. I still, you know, what are you using? Show me what games you're playing, who you're talking to, who's in your friends list. Because it's, until she leaves my home as an adult, she's still my child and she's still my responsibility. And these things go downhill so quickly you know, they go downhill and they and they can end up really badly really quickly. So we can't let we can't leave it to chance or let or expect them to come to us because most of the time they're not going to come to us. They're going to go to their friends for help. And that's what I've learned from this experience or f- from what I see on social media. And the other thing is is that our children, uh, you know, my daughter even says this all the time. She's like, our generation is screwed because we don't know how to be with each other. We all we know is to pick up our phone and talk to each other online. That's all they know. And she goes, and when you try and organize and and like to catch up with people, there's so much social anxiety right now. So what it's more than just our kids are addicted to their phones or it's more than they're addicted to devices. We've got some social economic like actual social issues going on and that we need to be aware of as parents and, and we need to have some grace and help them through it because they will get there. We just need to help them understand themselves what's going on for them. And that's so powerful to hear from, you know, your daughter's perspective of where teenagers are, are at, where at Fight the New Drug, where we're working to address the harms of pornography generally. We do hear from young people whose only, you know, experience with sexual intimacy is what they've seen in pornography. And then they get into a situation where they are actually with another person and they either don't know what to do or they reenact violence because that's what they've seen in pornography. So can you speak a little bit to what you've seen both in your work as a police officer and also in in the work that you're doing now with regard to how pornography is influencing this generation of young people? 
Yeah, well, probably the best way to describe it, and I saw it very um, clearly when I first joined the police in 2010 and I was starting to talk to young people and um, I'm not sure what it would be called over there, but in in Australia we call any type of uh, harm towards children by other children harmful sexualized behaviours. And so we was I was seeing harmful sexualized behaviours in young people and we naturally and usually assumed that that child had been abused. So in 2010, we were like, right, let's get them then interviewed. Someone's abusing them. Fast forward to when I was leaving my career in the police, when we had children coming forward that were being reported as having harmful sexualized behaviours and hurting other children, it was mostly because of pornography and their exposure to pornography. And that was in a 10-year period. So I saw that so clearly in that time. You know, there was the odd occasion where a child had been abused, but it was more prevalent that it was because of their overexposure to pornography. And, you know, in the last few years, the stat in Australia is that an average, the, the average age of a child seeing pornography for the first time is now eight years old. Now, an eight-year-old cannot understand what they're seeing and understand what's going on in that. And in Australia, again, we're seeing children uh, that, you know, there's two specific age groups that are harming children and being harmed. And what the harming children's age is that prepubescent, pubescent age, you know, 10 to 14, 15 are harming children of the three to nine-year-old age. So, you know, and and there's a real big correlation between the time they start seeing pornography or, you know, being exposed to pornography and, you know, when they start enacting or reenacting. And so that was what I saw in that state. But like you um, and what you hear from students, you know, my daughter's 15 years old and she has told me that boys have come to her because she's very openly talks about, you know, consent. And, you know, she was a little kid and that was one of the things we taught her when she was three or four, you know, stop it, I don't like it, to tell someone, an adult or anyone, but she didn't want something to happen. She used to put her hand and say, stop it, I don't like it. And as she got older, she would say, I don't consent to you doing that. And so she's very been very open and honest about consent and, and she talks about it and boys come to her that from her age group and they ask her questions and most of them are learning about sex through pornography. And, you know, some of them have girlfriends and they've come to my, my daughter for advice. This is the thing we, we're seeing, you know, teenagers talk to each other and they want advice from each other. Um, and she's hearing them say, I don't know anything about sex, you know, sex education, what's going on. I only know what I see in porn. And... Uh, I had a Swedish psychologist tell me at a conference I was at that she was seeing uh, teenage boys come to her because she was in that field saying, why doesn't my girlfriend scream when I'm when we're having sex, right? And the Swedish psychologist um, was saying that she was like, why do you think your girlfriend needs to scream? And, she goes, and he said, well, because she they scream in porn, right? So And they do this in porn. And so we're seeing like complete sexual behaviours being dictated by pornography. And I'll go one step further and, and say that during my time in the police, I saw many young men be charged with sexual assault cases because they didn't ask for consent. They did things that they thought they could do. They, they you know, might have had consent for one sexual act, but then they went and did another sexual act, which is, you know, a complete no-no when you're dealing with these sorts of things. So, you know, men are confused, young people are confused, and and it's all because we're uh, not having these conversations with our kids and they're learning from pornography. Yeah, wow, that's um, such a powerful perspective and kind of anecdotal experience to speak to what we're seeing that so many people are either unaware of or are aware of but have just normalized and said, you know, porn's porn's been around, so it's fine, but it, it's affecting young people so differently now. It's so prevalent and so available and it's really telling to hear these stories from from these young people. I imagine that in the work that you do, you you encounter issues or circumstances around sexting as well with young people. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, again, uh, when I was starting in the police, I, I have one story where a young 11-year-old girl, um, she just started high school in Australia and we, we were called in be, and I was interviewing her because... Uh, back then, eleven was really young to be to be sexting, right? And um, and we again assumed that she was being sexually abused uh, because that was that kind of behaviour back then was actually not normal. Um, and we're talking about two thousand eleven, twelve, and but 
as we, uh, but when I interviewed her and when I was talking to her, I actually found out, yes, she had been sexually assaulted. She had been forced to have, Mm -hmm. uh, to give oral sex to a young boy, an 11 year old boy in a toilet, but also that, you know, then she'd been pressured to, to share nudes and stuff like that. Back then that was very odd. But then we were, you know, fast forward again, and it's very normalized. I talk to young people, my daughters, you know, that age group. So I've got a bit of a understanding of what young people are seeing. And, you know, what we're seeing is, is that image uh, based abuse where, you know, a, a two kids that like each other, they share, and, you know, one of them might share a nude. And usually it's unsolicited. They've not asked for it. They just seem to think that, hey, I'll keep this person interested here. Hey, here's a picture of me. And, um, you know, that's another thing that we should be talking about is, you know, consensual sharing. Like we don't just stand there and flash ourselves to people. You know, I wouldn't stand and flash anyone else. So why are we sending pictures of ourselves to each other, you know? Um, And so, you know, that's usually non-consensual or non, uh, you know, not, not asked for. And then, you know, something happens or they get pressured to share it with their friends. And one of the things that we have happening over here is a lot of young people using it as a way to bully each other. And so that's a whole nother level of problems we've got with bullying between young people, sharing nudes and stuff like that. And that's on one side of the scale, you know, on the other side of the scale, we've got the sex distortions type stuff that I'm sure you guys are seeing as well, where young people are being approached for um for nudes and they're, they're, there's this fake account with, you know, someone pretending to be their age and then and now they think, oh, well, they've shared their nudes, I have to share mine. And, you know, they get pressured or they get told, hey, I'll delete them straight away. And, you know, young men, especially, you know, around 14, 15, but even up to 24, 25 are being approached by these people and these are, you know, these are scammers. They're just looking to be paid. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I get approached online all the time for advice from young men because they're they're getting absolutely hammered by these scammers. And so that we're seeing all of those things right now. I think the main thing I like to say to parents in this situation is if you need to sit down and talk to your kids about why they feel the need to share nudes, what is it that they are looking for in that moment? You know, it's not it's not about the nude. It's about the the feeling of being needed. It's the feeling of being wanted. Someone wants them something from them. It's about the feeling of being accepted. So what is it that it's actually about? Because that if children and young people and any person understood that, then they might think twice before posting. That's such good insight. And I think going back to what you said earlier about, you know, what does a feeling actually feel like in your body? What does it feel like to feel nervous or to feel apprehensive? asking those same questions, you know, what does it feel like when you're drawn to consume pornography or send a nude or that pressure? What does that feel like in in really understanding that to be able to know how to address it? So you started an organization called um, Child Abuse Prevention and Education Australia. And can you tell me a little bit about how that got started um, and your work here? So when I was leaving the police, I started I just kept thinking if parents knew what I knew, they would do things so much differently. They would have these conversations. They wouldn't be scared to have these conversations because you, you know, if you work with any type of student or you're ever speaking to kids, you realise that they're actually less scared than us to talk about this stuff, right? And um, and it's and it's not weird once you have the conversation. It's just when you start, it's a, feels weird because we didn't have that growing up. Well, I didn't have that growing up. So, yeah, I just kept thinking if parents knew what I knew, they would do things so differently. So I ended up writing, uh, spending two years and wrote a book about my experience in the police, but it's a guidebook for parents and it's got, you know, usable advice in there. And whilst I was writing that and I was and I was thinking, what do I do next? You know, I was sort of having a sabbatical and I was just sitting around, well, not quite sitting around. I was teaching kids at schools and doing stuff, but that was, you know, not full-time or anything like that I I just sort of thought well how can I give more to the community it's always been about how can I give more because that's who I am as a person I don't know I never realized that about myself until now but I I'm like what what more can I do so I started um yeah started child abuse prevention and education Australia and and I just started uh you know talking about this stuff online talking about it on TikTok um you know and talking about it on Instagram and sharing my experience from a police perspective because I think a lot of people don't understand that 
Although police are people too, we have a very unique perspective and and it's um, and a lot of people don't understand exactly what it is that police do and exactly what their rights are, you know, when it comes to this sort of stuff as well. One thing I didn't realise until I left the police is that how much I knew that people out there didn't know. So I just wanted to keep sharing that and that's my whole goal. I'm curious to know, as you have engaged in this work and are speaking with students and are encouraging parents to have these conversations, for any parents listening who might be apprehensive still to have these conversations, can you share with us what kinds of reactions you've seen maybe from other parents who were nervous at first but started having these conversations and I guess kind of success stories, so to speak, of kind of implementing what we've been talking about, having these conversations with with young people? Well, the thing, the thing I've seen which probably has the most impact is the change in dynamics in a relationship between young people and children and parents. You know, they uh, from feeling like, you know, the fact is is that, you know, most young people don't feel like that they can talk to their parents openly about some of this stuff unless a parent makes the effort to make those changes or to create that environment. You know, I'm not saying my daughter tells me everything because she doesn't. I found that found out things after the fact. And I'm not the perfect parent in any way, shape or form. Like I've got a story where um, my daughter saw porn for the first time. I was absolutely mortified because we'd had the conversation and we talked about it. And, you know, I sat there having a little bit of a mild panic attack while she's, you know, thinking, telling me that she, you know, she was having sex education or puberty education at school. And I thought I had done all the work and she Googled sex. And of course, what does the first thing that comes up when you Google sex is porn? And she saw porn and she came and told me, right? That is the best case scenario because if we can have those conversations and and our children know that they can come to us and we're a safe place, then that is the best case scenario Even because they're going to make mistakes. They're going to send those nudes. They're going to look at porn. They're going to have all of those moments. But if they know what they need to know, which is, you know, it's not real, uh, it's, you know, it's not healthy, it does things to our brain, in regards to pornography, we have no control over who gets that nude once we send it from our phone or device. But even if you do make a mistake, I still love you anyway, you know, then our children have somewhere safe to go because most of the trouble that our young people are having is that they feel like they have to deal with it on on their own and they're alone. We often say it's not if, it's when, right? It's not if they see porn, it's when they see porn. And I, you're so right. That is the best case scenario to have your child see porn and tell you, right? Because if they tell you, then they're not having to Google, what is this? Um, which will lead them down a road that will be much more difficult for them to understand than anything that you as a safe person could tell them. So that's such a, a helpful an- anecdote to hear. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about yet or addressed yet that you would like to share with our audience? I guess just, you know, realize that it's not just one conversation as well. Like it's not the, hey, let's sit down and have the birds and bee talk that we used to seeing in in shows and TV. It's an ongoing every day, all the time communication, back and forth, listening. Um, And also um, probably the one thing or a couple of things that I would say is that you know, meet your children where they're at. If they love Roblox, go and play Roblox and talk to them while they're playing Roblox because I tell you what, while they're distracted, they're going to, like, talk about stuff. You know, if they like, if they, if you're in the car heading somewhere and it's just you and them, you know, it's just the two of you, then, you know, just check in and sit there or, you know, late at night or when they're going to bed and you lay down, you know, like they were when they were little and you used to read them a book. You know, just lay there and say, check in with your teenager or a young person, check in with your young person and just say, you know, like, hey, I know it's hard to be a teenager. I know it's hard because I tell you what, it's freaking hard. I remember it from my perspective as a teenager and I, I didn't have a good, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the social media. We didn't have any of it. It was hard for me. So it must be 10 times harder for them. Such good advice for parents and and anyone listening, um, including, you know, educators, community leaders, anyone who is interacting regularly with young people, but also anyone who's living in this tech heavy world anyway, you know, these are all new things we have to navigate and it's helpful to have tools and resources to do that. Um, I would love for you to tell our listeners where they can go to learn more about your organization or your book or the resources that you have available. Yeah, so I actually just released a um, an online course 
in regards to this. Um, it's for a device safety. It's called Device Safety 101, a detective's guide to device safety. So it's come from myself as a, you know, a detective and it's 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 based around, you know, how to protect your kids, not only from them using their devices and to make it easier for you because there's a lot in there that I learned as a parent and as a police officer, but also just, you know, the 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 legal side to it, which most parents don't understand, you know, the age of consent and all of those things. So that that's what I've released. But I've also got my book. Um, it's available on Amazon. And you can f- link up with me on social media. So I'm on um, Instagram under Christy McVie author and on TikTok as the TikTok Cop 81. <laughs> I, lo- I love that. Um, and, yeah, <laughs> so you good. can just... Yeah, someone told me to do it and I did like two and a half years ago and I'm laughing over it. Um, So, yeah, so you can find me on there. I mean, I have lots and lots of, I share lots and lots of videos on this stuff on TikTok. Um, You know, if someone asks a question, I'll answer it. So that's a good uh, place to go or otherwise on Instagram, I'm always sharing on there as well. Well, let me just say, Christy, you it was so lovely to get to talk with you. I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing in Australia and also that we can share this um, with our audience across the globe as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing what you continue to do in the future. Thanks, Natalie. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. As a global movement with millions of fighters worldwide, we're continually growing and creating resources that educate and raise awareness on this issue across the globe. Included in our globalization efforts are our ongoing translation projects, which involve professionally translating select materials and resources into other languages. See what translated resources we have, including our documentary, Brain Heart World in Spanish, our conversation guide, Let's Talk About Porn, and more at ftnd.org forward slash resources. That's ftnd.org forward slash resources. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. Check out the episode notes for resources mentioned in this episode. If you find this podcast helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a review. Consider Before Consuming is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to support Consider Before Consuming, you can make a one-time or recurring donation of any amount at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. Thanks again for listening. We invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.